hopefully you guys had some fun solving some uh, paper and pencil based crypto. So now let's start talking about uh, real world uh, computer based cryptography. I'm Mansi Shet. Uh, I work for uh, Veracode. Uh, I'm a, I have over eight years of uh, uh, security experience. Last five years at Veracode uh, being a researcher, uh, I look at a lot of different uh, programming languages and frameworks in my day try to analyze and see how insecurely they can be written and leave applications completely open and then obviously suggest those things for our, uh, how to automatically find this to our uh, binary static analysis tools. Uh, one such project was uh, looking at different crypto implementations across different languages and libraries. Uh, I found Java the mo uh, something which needed most uh, amount of attention and that's where I come from. Uh, I'm a crypto enthusiast. I like solving crypto puzzles, as you saw. But I'm not a cryptographer or a mathematician or a cryptologist or any of that. There are just like two dozen such people on Earth right now. Uh, and I'm not going to make any one of you here a cryptologist at the end of just 35 minutes, just so that we have our expectations straight. Uh, cryptography is everywhere. It's probably half of the things right now you might be doing apart from listening to me, like may maybe checking your emails or logged onto Wi-Fi or uh, maybe doing some cryptocurrency mining. Uh, it's not only you guys here, but even your family, your friends, everyone you know around here would be doing something or the other with cryptography. This is the state of Earth we currently live in and thus responsibility lies on every one of us here who are responsible or have any encounter with uh, crypto to get it secured and get it right. Uh, before I go uh, deeper into this, I wanted to make a few disclaimers. Uh, as a security professional, I definitely want to say, if you ever encounter any situations where someone is writing their own crypto algorithms and using it in their systems, please stop that. We really have to trust the implementers who have spent years trying to understand and study the specifications which needed even more number of years to come up with and fight against. And that is available for all of us in any major language or framework we pick up to and it's available for us to use. Some uh, less secured out of the box, some more secured out of the box, but it is all there and it's just up to us to get it right. And uh, if you have your crypto systems uh, perfectly secure, Kudos to you guys, but that does not mean we don't put any mitigations of other non-crypto related bugs in our systems. We still have to do mitigations for any other bugs like cross-site or SQL or any, that, any of that. So don't ignore those either. Uh, okay, uh, so since this talk is about Java, I expect uh, some of you, uh, so, uh, I expect most of you having some kind of encounter with using Java and cryptography. So just, just trying to understand here, uh, what are your roles? Like uh, security engineers involved in uh, writing uh, secure applications, uh, raise your hand. Um, maybe like more product security folks trying to make sure the systems uh, they are doing are secured enough. Managers who want to uh, become police officers about this. No, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as I can see here, most of you all are, uh, almost 100% here are involved with some level of uh, crypto encounter in your, uh, in the system, in your crypto systems. And what behind the scene you are using is uh, Java's ship, Java cryptography architecture, which I will call as JCA from now. Uh, JCA ships with a set of engine classes which you would be using in your crypto systems. And what are these engine classes? They are basically just interfaces whose implementations are supplied by different providers, again shipped by JCA. Uh, JCA out of box comes with around a little more than half a dozen of providers and, uh, and they are being configured as a list in the Java security config file external to the, yeah, basically defaulted in the JDK shipped by uh, Oracle. Uh, for the, uh, so for the most part, you should be okay with using the default uh, Java's providers. Uh, Java took some time to catch up with all different kinds of algorithms and primitives, but it has caught up well. So there is no reason you really need to bother with all the complicated third party providers and scaling it across your systems or anything at this point in time, unless 
unless you are in some specific situation where JCA does not provide API support for some application which you might be in. Like for example, no sane person wants to deal with parsing cert files and JCA does not provide API for it. So that might be a good time to uh, look at some third party help to uh, come up with, uh, use that particular API or, or some algorithmic support which you absolutely need and not in, not in JCA, which we will see in uh, digital signatures. Now, if you have to add a third party provider, which I don't think you need to, then this is the most common way I have seen being uh, adding a third party provider. It's all cool, but the problem is uh, this particular provider adds, the, adds your provider to the end of the list end of the list in the Java security config file we saw in the previous slide. What that means is whenever you are having your engine class tell that, okay, give me this uh, algorithm, it will go through the list in that particular properties file. And if there is any provider which supplies that algorithm about this added algorithm, about the, uh, before the last added provider, that provider's algorithm is taking uh, precedence, which is probably not what you want if you're trying to add a provider. So in my opinion, just go and change the Java property, Java config file, or there is an insert at uh, API also where you can actually forcefully say insert my API, insert, insert my third party provider at this particular location in the properties file. So something, uh, uh, use uh, watcher because I've seen this happening a lot. Uh, why am I standing here? Because I have a lot of empathy for developers. Uh, I personally took around 20, uh, 20 stabs at understanding the Java cryptographic architecture document, which is supposed to be used by all developers. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely bad. It, it's like very complicated designs. The defaults being used, even in the code snippets, are completely insecure. Uh, the documentation talks about more ambiguous stuff than making things clear. There is no security uh, responsibility taken by Oracle saying that we have to support this legacy application, uh, legacy algorithms, which were actually deprecated two decades ago, but, but you don't use that. There is no such disclaimer from there. So it's pretty much left to the developer who just wants to solve the problem and move ahead. So, uh, so there are lots of uh, those kind of interesting things happening. Uh, so from here, uh, the way I have uh, divided the talk is uh, I'll pick up each, uh, each cryptographic primitive, talk about things which are, uh, problematic things where I have seen most things are uh, breaking uh, with uh, enough code simplets hopefully to make the thing clear. Uh, very first thing, uh, cryptographically secure random number generator. This cryptographic primitive is used everywhere. It's used for any kind of keying material, keys, initialization vectors, nonces everywhere. It's pretty much the basic building block of any cryptographic system you are ever going to design. What properties we expect out of it? The, the, the random number generator should generate numbers which are completely unpredictable. Knowing the previous bit, we should not be able to guess the current bit. It, sh it should be completely random. Knowing this bit, we should not be able to guess what the next bit would be. And it should be completely, it should not be able to, we should not be able to reproduce that number again ever. I mean, ever is relative, but ever. And no, math.random does not qualify. I have seen this like many, many times where uh, the Java lang.math comes with a random function and they are using it for uh, cryptographic operations. No, it does not exhibit all the properties we expect out of it. So please stop it right there. Okay, how, how does the CSPRNG work in uh, JCA? This is the most simplistically I can explain. Uh, most of, not most, all the algorithms which are shipped for CSPRNG by JCA are secured out of the box. But if you don't configure the, how it is initialized and what uh, source of entropy uh, the algorithm is going to use, it's very, very trivial to guess the output. So it's, it's very important that we configure these two parameters uh, securely. Now, how does Java help us do this? So Java, uh, while for seeding mechanism, uh, it has two, uh, it, in the JCA document, it talks about two things. It talks about self-seeding and explicit, explicit seeding. Now, how much ever counterintuitive the word self-seeding sounds, that's what we want. 
that's that's when we are telling the operating system to take control over how to seed the random number generator. And explicit seeding means we are giving the developers code the responsibility to seed the algorithm, which we never want. And how to seed this algorithm, what source of entropy? There are broadly two uh, sources of entropy, blocking source and a non-blocking source. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, is uh, The way I, I think about it is a bucket where, uh, where all the operating system interrupts and hardware interrupts and timing cycles, they all put their input in it. And there is a threshold set on that bucket. When we say we want a blocking source to seed the algorithm, that if the threshold is not met, we are just, the blocking source will just block the algorithm, wait till, I, till my threshold is met, and then I will give you entropy. And non-blocking is completely opposite. The, the moment algorithm asks, it will give it whatever entropy it has from that bucket. Uh, now, I think cryptographers are basically very pessimistic people. They, they think that if they, ha if, uh, if they are going to use any kind of non uh, blocking source of, uh, sorry, non-blocking source of entropy, the world is going to fall apart. It's not sufficient to the uh, entropy given, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I personally think for the 80 or the 90% of the crypto systems I have seen, non-blocking source is good enough. Now, unless you are in that 10% of the situation, you will probably know it for yourself and you might just use non-blocking. So uh, to take away, always use self-seeding and, and probably use a non-blocking source. Uh, this is the first time I'm showing, uh, showing uh, code snippets. Uh, this is all uh, in the, my GitLab repo, which is all in a modern uh, Java cryptographic modules and all those things. So you don't have to take screenshots or anything here and just, just enjoy the talk, yeah. Uh, so, if, uh, so if you're right, so now since, uh, uh, Seeding is operating system based. What is the most agnostic way to write a most secured CSPRNG? Get the engine class, initialize it, and immediately follow it by any of the next star methods. You have next byte, int, long, whatever, any of the next methods. It's when you use the next method is actually when the operating system is seeding with the configured source of entropy, the algorithm. And in between, if you use this set seed method, that's when the developer seeding comes into picture in which we definitely never want to do. Set seed is uh, provided by this engine class for some other reason and uh, which is documented in the, in the Java docs, but take away never ever have a set seed before the net, next bytes uh, or next star uh, API is ever used. Uh, since this is like pretty much the building block of any cryptographic system, I like picked up some uh, anti-patterns out from internet. Any guesses what's the problem with this one? Anyone? Yes. So even, uh, so even if we think that timestamp um, time in milliseconds is sufficient entropy, it's definitely not and we should not be doing that. So. There are some uh, very smart developers I have seen who think that they can give more uh, entropy, more than the operating system, which is not the case. This example, anyone? Uh, it's a still, and any guesses what the output is actually? Output is actually one, two, three. Yeah. This one? You are initializing the engine class with again an explicit seed. And again, the output is one, two, three in this case. So these, these are all common stack overflow code snippets I've picked up. So please be worried about these things. OK, the next uh, primitive encryption and decryption, which is pretty much synonymous to cryptography sometimes. Uh, the most basic way, uh, encryption is when you want to obscure the meaning of the data, and decryption is when you have you are authorized to have keys to actually decrypt them, uh, get the meaning out of that encrypted data. There are two broad categories of algorithms, uh, symmetric or block ciphers, where the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt the your data, and asymmetric or public keys when different set of keys are involved. Applications, it's used everywhere. It's used for data at rest, data in transit, and everything in between. Okay, now to get a simple cipher going, 
in my opinion, there are these five parameters we should configure very, very vigilantly to get a very secured uh, cipher. Uh, which, are, which are these? Uh, you obviously have to specify the algorithm. Uh, you specify the mode of the mode of the algorithm's operation, which is only relevant in uh, symmetric encryption or block ciphers. Padding scheme: your data is never going to be the exact size your algorithm is used to working in, so you have to pad it with extra data and make it of exact size the encryption algorithm can work on. Obviously, the keys. And initialization vectors is again uh, relevant only in symmetric encryption. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Now, just to configure these five parameters, no, it does not matter uh, symmetric or asymmetric, there are minimum three to four classes involved with its own set of interfaces and hierarchies just in Java. So, so it's just imagine how easy it is to uh, do something wrong. Now, luckily, uh, the first three parameters, which is the algorithm mode of operation and padding scheme, is configured by a single string called the transformation string. Now, these are the list of options or uh, algorithms which is supplied by JCA 10, not even like 6 or 7, I'm talking about the latest JCA. Just, just meditate over the slides, look at number of uh, red dots and number of green dots. And just imagine how easy it is to pick a wrong choice and just uh, break your cipher. Uh -oh. Okay, so how to configure uh, these three parameters? Uh, first thing is, if you want to take away one thing from this section is always specify the entire uh, transformation string as the algorithm slash your uh, mode of operation and your padding scheme. And why I'm saying so? Because the defaults which JCA decides to take, if you don't specify it yourself, it's completely insecure. So for example, if you are using uh, doing asymmetric encryption, uh, use RSA algorithm. Use ECB. ECB is only relevant in block ciphers, I know, but in the Java world, ECB behind the scene translates to none, and that's why we are writing ECB here. And, uh, and the documentation does not talk very openly about uh, OAP algorithms and how to configure its different digests, but uh, this is the way to do it. This is, uh, this is what is working. So always use OAP with uh, the right hash and the MGF padding for it. So. And that's how asymmetric should be done. And for symmetric, uh, use an authentication and authenticated encryption, uh, which only is a GCM from JCA side. Uh, algorithm, obviously, always AC, uh, AES, uh, 3DEF, everything is deprecated a decade ago. I don't know why Java is still talking about it, but just forget about those things. Uh, some things I have seen uh, out, uh, AES, and someone is still using ECB because it is defaulted in RSA, it's confusing. But ECB mode in AES is a very, very bad idea. So never do that. And the last one is something which I've seen the most common and the most dangerous. It again maps to the second last line. Uh, defaults is ECB and uh, uh, PKCS padding, which is okay. So yeah, this is how to configure those three parameters. Uh, next is keys. So keys is uh, relatively straightforward. Use uh, the key pair generator engine class for public keys. Uh, the size should be at least 2048. I would say much go for 4096 or even higher. There is no reason not to in this uh, crypto power age. Uh, for symmetric, I would say uh, go for 256 if you can. If you're writing software for you know, outside United States, go for 256. If not, don't lose your sleep. Use 128. One good thing is uh, Java 10 defaults comes with unlimited jurisdiction, so now you don't have to go and install a jurisdiction policy for 256 bits, so which is a, which is a good thing. Uh, lastly, initialization vectors. Uh, as we said, this is uh, very relevant only in uh, symmetric encryption. Uh, now, Java, uh, most of the configurations happens to something called as open uh, specification. What it means is that uh, JCA does not decide to give a lot of control of the different algorithmic parameters to the developers because they don't trust developers, and which is the right thing to do, except for initialization vectors. Now, in the Java docs, uh, there is a Cypher API which says that if you use this last parameter as a, as a CSP RNG, that's what is going to be used for all different parameters, randomization, everything, et cetera, et cetera. It, ran, it might be true, but it did not ever randomize my initialization vector. So the only way I could initialize the IVs for the GCM mode was through transparent initialization, 
go through the hierarchy uh, of uh, controlling the different parameters and uh, go through the GCM specs and configure the IV in the most CSP RNG way. Okay, once we have these five things in place, hopefully we should have a pretty good cipher. Okay, uh, next primitive, uh, hash functions, very simple and sneak. You give a huge input through to a hash function, a fixed size output is coming. This output could be called like hash or tags or checksums or whatever. I'm just going to stick to hash. It does not involve any keys. It reduces all those complexities. What, operate, what properties we expect out of a hash are, uh, it should be one way. Given one input, it should always generate the same output. It should be collusion resistant. It should not have, we should not have two inputs which can map to the same output. That's a disaster. And it should, the output should be unpredictable. Uh, what kind of a security strength do we expect? This is mainly to avoid brute forcing uh, at least 256 bits because 128, 2 raised to 128 is good enough uh, security strength. Uh, applications, it's used at a lot of places. It's used for calculating max, uh, authenticating your APIs, digital search, file integrity checks, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now again, uh, JCA comes with this bunch of algorithms, even in the latest version. Uh, again, look at the red arrows. I would say stick to SHA-2 family of algorithms. Uh, SHA-3 wasn't uh, introduced to replace SHA-2. It's it's still newer, it's not very well vetted out by all the implementers. Uh, unless you have any reason to not use SHA-2, which I could not come up with any, I don't see us using SHA-3 at the moment. If you decide to use SHA-3, and if you decide to use it through some third party provider, there is a huge naming confusion. Like SHA-3 could even mean SHA-2's 384 bit output or something. So just just be vigilant of what exact algorithm you are actually trying to use. The only thing I want to point out with uh, related to coding mistakes here is uh, when someone is trying, uh, there is a way, uh, to, the digest works on all the data you want to digest. Just to first collect all the data you want to digest and then apply the digest name. Lot of times what we have seen is they just pick the first n bytes of the buffer and just apply the digesting. So it's like if, if it's 100 lines, they just digest the first line. It, it does not make any sense. So that's why the importance of uh, applying the repeated while loop on all the data. Okay, these are the three basic crypto primitives. Now, uh, very rarely they are used in isolation. It's always used in a more higher level operations. Uh, these are the main uh, operations which I have seen mostly used across and for which JCA comes out with an engine class. So I will uh, quickly go through those. Uh, first is a message authentication code. It's a symmetric uh, encryption uh, based uh, primitive uh, based application. Uh, it's the same keys are used for by the sender and the receiver side. The sender side computes the uh, using the symmetric key computes the MAC, sends the MAC and the actual data to the receiver. Receiver recomputes it with the same key. If the MACs match, you have uh, integrity check and authenticity on the data you are being passing around. And then I, there is nothing difficult about this. Uh, the only thing I wanted to point was uh, the HMAC algorithm. It's always better to use uh, uh, the right and the most secured ones, but if you are using like, for example, HMAC SHA, uh, SHA-1 or something, which is a very collusion, which has a lot of collusion resistance issues. It's okay. The collusion, the internal algorithm, the hash function is not the problem for your Mac. It's the keys which are usually the problem. But there is no reason to go and use an older algorithm. Always use the newer one. Uh, next one is uh, obviously digital signatures. Uh, here you have a signer and a verifier. It's based on asymmetric encryption. Uh, the signer signs with his uh, private key, the data, and sends the key assigned to the verifier who recomputes the sign from the public key. And if they match, you get all these properties. Now, as we were speaking earlier, it's a asymmetric based, uh, based uh, application. Uh, you should always try to use uh, uh, MG, uh, MGF based padding uh, schemes. 
Now, interestingly, JSTA has algorithm support for it, but it does not have engine class support for this through the signature API. I have tried through a lot of different transparent specifications to figure out whether there is a API support for this uh, engine class, but there is none. So this is one instance I would suggest go for a third party provider where it is much easier to just use the right algorithm, unfortunately, but yeah. Uh, and the last one, uh, sorry. Okay, I'm seeing something else here and something else here. Okay, cool. Uh, last one, how to store your passwords. Uh, I'm sure everyone has faced this issue. Uh, it even leads to how to authenticate your users. Uh, you might have uh, started your career with hashing and salting the user passwords and storing in the database and everything. It's all not very good anymore these days and everyone knows why. Uh, one of the best ways to do it is to use a password-based key derivative function. Now, Java does not talk about the support for this ever anywhere in the entire documentation, except for when I was actually debugging different providers and their support through one, some command line utility or something, and I figured out, oh, what is this PB uh, key expect thing doing for us? And that's when I realized, okay, they do have this support. So now, if you really have an option, you should definitely try to use more mature algorithms like Argon, Argon2, or Bscript, or Script or anything. But JC has support for it, it's good enough. Uh, this is how I would recommend you configuring these parameters. Uh, obviously your user, uh, like a very low entropy user entered password, you should never store it play, uh, as it is in your database. Your salt should be at least 64 bits in uh, size. Iteration algorithm is number of times the hashing should be applied on the password. It should be at least 10,000. I would say go for 20,000. Today's uh, computer power definitely permits that. This is mainly to slow down brute forcing attacks and expect the output key length to be at least 256 characters. And obviously use a nice secured HMAC algorithm for it. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is what I had for all the crypto primitives. Uh, obviously crypto is a very important topic. Uh, responsibility is all of ours to make sure whatever systems, however we are involved in through our employers, through our private projects, whatever, it's secured enough. And uh, yeah, that comes to the conclusion slide. Uh, I have all the code templates working as Java modules and microservices on the GitLab here. And I have been blogging about all these primitives in a much, much, much more detail than I can ever cover in 35 minutes on my company's uh, blog, so yeah, do visit that. And uh, sorry, and at this point I can take questions, I think I can. Yeah. It's basically to reinitialize the algorithm after you have initially seeded it. So like after after using the initial seed for like for, for example x number of times you want to reseed the algorithm, that's when you use set seed. So it does not produce determinist, deterministic output, but if it is used before the algorithm is initialized by the next seed, it will produce deterministic. Yes, sir. Sorry, password based? I would go for Bcrypt. But if, I mean, since I'm focusing more on uh, JCS stuff, uh, I just wanted to point out that there is a way to do that. If you don't want to relearn a new API or something, you at least can do this. I'm seeing different slides different places. That's interesting. Sorry. Any more questions? Okay, I'm around today, tomorrow, sorry. Finally. Okay, I think. Yeah. Any more questions? I'm around today, tomorrow. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, 